Welcome back, folks, and on to interest groups and political parties. And here are learning outcomes for the week. We'll define interest groups and political parties. We'll identify major types of interest groups. We'll compare direct and indirect interest group techniques and how they're utilized by different types of interest groups. We'll identify the major roles played by U.S. political parties, and we'll outline the history of American political parties. Okay, let's differentiate between an interest group and a political party. An interest group is an organization whose members share common goals or objectives, and they attempt to influence public policy. They try to shift public policy and the, and, and the people that make public policy um, in our democracy um, to those goals and objectives at all levels of government. So that could be the state level, that could be the federal level, that's the executive branch, the legislative branch. They will file lawsuits in, in state courts and lawsuits in federal courts and often attempt to uh, influence uh, public bureaucracies as well. Now, a political party, this is a little bit easier uh, to remember. First of all, it's a collection of groups. So, you know, you, a party is a collection of different interests. And political parties are a group of activists that, that organize to win elections. So the ultimate goal of political parties is to run the government and actually create public policy. Interest groups want to influence the government. Political parties actually want to win elections and run the government, and they're a collection of interests. In de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, he wrote of what he was seeing in the early years of the Republic, that this was a country of joiners and people were associating and these organizations were in conflict with each other. So. Um, he saw early on that the United States was developing into a pluralistic society with different groups that were um, essentially jockeying for political power and influence. There are thousands of interest groups in the United States representing tens of millions of Americans. In many cases, people are members of multiple interest groups. These groups could range from and do range from uh, the Boy Scouts of America to the NRA to PETA, which is an animal rights organization. And they tend to be well organized. They engage in fundraising. They have clear policy objectives and goals. They're either trying to shape public policy or, or American attitudes. And we'll talk about some of that. But these are well organized groups and their members share these, these objectives. This is different, by the way, than a social movement. Social movement is much more grassroots in nature. So interest groups may support social movements, but social movements are, are, are not as well organized. So things like Black Lives Matter is something that has been a very much a social movement. Um, now, just because an interest group exists and somebody is an eligible member or might benefit from membership, not everybody joins. Uh, for example, someone might benefit from union wages in a in a state or an area but might choose not to join a union so this gets into the concept of a free rider somebody who benefits from um, an organized interest group but decides not to join um, simply because either they don't want to pay dues or they just don't want to uh, spend their time organizing the most numerous type of interest group are economic related interest groups um, so these are groups like the Chamber of Commerce, business interest groups, agricultural interest groups are extremely powerful in the United States. Only about 2% of Americans work in the agricultural industry, and yet um, uh, uh, agriculture is a very powerful lobby in the United States, and a great deal of public funds go into supporting American agriculture, which is one of the reasons why um, uh, food in the United States is, is less expensive than maybe you'd see elsewhere. Um, it's heavily funded. We have labor interest groups, so uh, we, you might think of those as, as um, labor unions. And in most cases, um, labor unions have been in decline uh, for about the last 40 years. So, you know, 40, 50 years ago in the state of Minnesota, you would find the majority of people um, either uh, uh, it, uh, a member of a union or they have a contract that's negotiated by a union, now we would see that uh, less than 10%. However, one area of union growth has been in public employee unions. Um, that could be things like firefighting unions or police unions or uh, uh, teacher unions and so forth. So we have seen a growth in that area. 
Um, so the labor movement as a whole is not as powerful and what we're, as it once was. We see a number of states with so-called uh, right-to-work policies that make it very difficult for uh, people to um, to organize uh, labor unions and negotiate collectively on a contract. We see interest groups for professionals um, like physicians, like lawyers, and so forth. One area that's certainly underrepresented by interest groups are the unorganized poor. So when we talk about um, um, pluralism and interest groups sort of fighting it out for resources in a democracy, not everybody is is um, is reflected in this competition. Not everybody is supported equally. And this gets into you know a weakness of pluralism is that certain groups that are have been sort of historically neglected. Um, you know, don't uh, don't have a strong advocate in when it comes to making public uh, decisions. This graph deals with what I was just exploring. We've seen public sector unions at least hold steady uh, over the last 30 years or so, but the private sector unions have been in pretty sharp decline. Some other types of interest groups, environmental interest groups have obviously been growing rapidly in the last 40 years, focused on climate change, focused on pollution, and uh, a number of other issues. Um, these groups are not only trying to change public policy, but also trying to change public attitudes about the government. Public interest groups uh, that support consumers, consumer safety when it comes to things like cigarettes or and tobacco products as a whole. Uh, the safety of automobiles. These have been areas where uh, groups have um, have risen to to fight for consumer interests. Um, other groups that we tend to see foreign interest groups, for example, people who um, uh, like IPAC that that takes a look at um, the American Israeli relationship and supports robust su uh, funding and support military support for um, Israel. Ideological groups that could be um, uh, groups like Tea Party groups, very uh, much more conservative, um, uh, more liberal groups. Um, uh, we also see groups that are strongly associated with pro-life or pro-choice policies. All right, what makes an interest group powerful? Size, resources obviously matter. If you have millions of members, that means you also have millions of voters. Um, if they're paying dues, that is a source of revenue. If you're supported by corporate interests, one of the things that makes the NRA historically so powerful is they have a large, they have millions of members. They pay dues. Not only that, but they're supported by the gun industry, and um, and that has historically been a very profitable sector of the economy. So that combination together has made them quite powerful. Leadership and strategy is obviously important. How prominent is the leader? How charismatic? Is there a clear strategy? Do they have clear policy goals and so forth? And some of that is driven by how cohesive is an interest group. Um, are the members on the same page or do they differ? You know, so you could have a very uh, large interest group like the AARP, the American Association of Retired People, and that's pretty much everybody that's retired. And they agree in some areas like on, you know, uh, funding for Medicare and funding for Social Security and things of that nature. But they differ quite a bit in terms of whether they're liberal or conservative or more Republican or Democratic leaning and so on. So there's some ideological differences there. Um, and again, to look back at the NRA as a very historically powerful interest group, there is a great deal of cohesiveness among the NRA members. So what are some strategies and interest groups use to um, influence public policy and also influence public attitudes? First of all, lobbying. They hire lobbyists. Um, lobbyists, by the way, are paid professionals who are, uh, it's their job to reach out to elected uh, um, officials. It's their job to reach out to those in public bureaucracy and influence the decisions that are made that to put them in line with the objectives of, you know, whatever interest group we're looking at. So how do they do that? Uh, well, they fund campaigns. That's very important. They meet with legislators individually. Um, lobbying, by the way, is, is something that a lot of people do with the background in political science. And so, you know, just about any interest group will, uh, any prominent interest group at the state level or the federal level, they'll employ lobbyists. So whether that be a teacher's union, an environmental group, uh, animal rights group, a uh, um, 
organization that is pushing for expanded civil rights. Um, these are all areas that, that um, hire professional lobbyists. Of course, any of us can lobby, right? We can meet with our legislators. We can tell them our views. We can tell them what we think they ought to be uh, supporting in, um, as, they, as they craft public policy and laws. One of the ways that interest groups work is they rate candidates. So you could have an environmental group that rates those who are strongest on environmental policies and those who are weakest. They could have the dirty dozen, you know, of uh, uh, members of Congress that support polluting industries or whatever. Um, again, this is an area where the NRA is quite powerful. They give everybody an A through F rating um, in Congress to determine how supportive they are to expanding um, gun rights. And, you know, as I mentioned, campaign assistance, um, interest groups will form political action committees and those political action committees will fund campaigns and fund political parties. Some indirect techniques, um, you're going to see this in the film this week, but powerful interest groups are going to reach out to their membership and they're going to say, you need to call your, you need to call this individual or you need to call your congressperson or you need to show up to a town hall and you need to fight for this position. So that's using their members as lobbyists, using their members to put pressure on elected officials. There are um, a number of regulations that limit lobbyists, both at the state level and the, and the federal level. In many cases, if people do this as their primary way of making a living, they need to register as lobbyists. There are limits on um, certainly things of individual uh, gift giving, and um, that varies between the state and the federal level. All right, on to political parties. Again, the difference between political parties and interest, group is, interest groups are that political parties actually want to run the government. They want to win elections and run the government. They're a collection of interests. Um, in many cases, they're supported by interest groups, but members of political parties, they actually want to do the governing. How do they do this? They recruit candidates for public office. They organize and run elections, particularly primary elections to determine uh, who's going to represent their party. If they don't win the election or they're not in power, they present alternative policies to the electorate. So it's their job to say, hey, this is what we should be doing. And if they do win elections, they accept responsibility for actually operating the government. Some more concepts here related to political parties. Um, you know, in terms of how political parties actually function, you have the party in the electorate. These are voters. These are activists. These are party members. These are people who are demanding policy outcomes from their political party. Uh, they're uh, arguing over what the platform of a political party is, what the party should stand for. That's essentially what a political platform is. And then you have the party in government. Once the election's over, how political parties actually run the government. So in our systems at the federal and at the state level, the party that controls the Senate, the party that controls the House, they get to run the show. They get to run the agenda. The party that controls the presidency. In many cases, we have divided government. We'll have the president that's Republican and a Democratic House of Representatives, as we do now. So um, how do the political parties actually run their branch or um, part of government? And that's what we refer to as the party in government. Do spend adequate time understanding the history of the two-party system in the United States. You know, right off the bat, uh, the United States develops and splits into a two-party system. So there's this precedent that's formed early between Federalists and Anti-Federalists, those that support this new constitution um, and those who wanted to see greater states' rights and um, a system of government that was much more like the, um, the Articles of Confederation. So this starts right off the bat, even though Washington and others warned of the development of factions and by that, it was kind of another term for the period um, of, it was a synonym for political parties. Um, we start down that path right away. And right away, um, our legislatures at the state level and the federal level start to organize around political parties. So we've seen throughout most of American history, even though we've called the parties different things, we've seen two strong political parties and they've changed in name. 
um, the modern Democrat and Republican Party, those formed after the Civil War. For the last generation or so, it's been an era of divided government. The parties are in rough balance, although we have seen a lot of movement in what the parties stand for over the last generation or so. Um, increasingly, uh, Republican Party has become the party of the South. It has been become the party of rural America. Increasingly, the Democratic Party has become the party of the North, the party of big cities. You know, that is almost completely opposite to what you would have seen in, um, you know, 100 years ago, where the Republican Party was much more the party of the North and the Democratic Party was much more the party of rural America, for example. Uh, even though the parties remain in relatively close balance today, we do tend to see wave elections where public sentiment pushes one party out in front. Uh, we saw this in 2008, where there was a wave election in favor of President Obama, and there was a lot of uh, turnout from, from folks that hadn't participated in the past. Maybe they were too young to participate. Uh, there was a lot of excitement among African-American voters. And then we also saw a wave election in 2010 with the rise of the Tea Party movement. In some ways, it was a backlash to the Obama election, and Republicans did very well in picking up seats in the House and in the Senate in um, in 2010. Um, 2016 was a very close election. Um, President Trump did very well. It was a historic election in the sense that uh, many people didn't think he had a chance of winning, but he did lose the popular vote. So, um, and the, um, yeah, the outcome of that election was much more, it'd be hard to call it a wave. Uh, 2018, we did see a wave for Democrats, and Democrats were able to retake uh, the House of Representatives uh, in that election cycle. So we're going to see, you know, what happens with regard to 2020. Is this a wave election or is it another close election? Our country more and more has, de has developed into a red and blue America with two very different electorates. Um, part of this has to do with what we discussed before and how uh, we're... Uh, getting our information from very different uh, news sources, and we've developed very different attitudes about the role of government. We are also in an anti-partisan period where we tend to see, or an area of neg negative partisanship, I should say, where we tend, uh, members of each political party views the other political party very negatively. You know, take a look at the map from 2016, and you see the key to President Trump's victory was the inroads he was able to be to to make in the industrial Midwest uh, areas that had traditionally been had high levels of union membership, um, areas that have traditionally voted uh, Democratic in many ways, but that have become much more socially conservative and have large uh, rural white populations. Let's make sure we understand the concepts of realignment and dealignment. Realignment's the process in which a large number of voters switch party allegiance over a period of time. So if, if you were to go back to the Great Depression, uh, you would have seen the Republican Party was much more the party of the North, the party of big city. America was the party that was much more liberal and progressive on the issue of race. The Democratic Party was the party of the South, as the party that supported segregation. Um, and now, you know, in, in the modern period, we see that that's almost completely switched, that the Democratic Party is now much more the party of the North, the party of the coast. The Republican Party is much more the party of the South. Uh, so how did this realignment happen? Well, you know, this is something that you're going to see, especially when you have two party system, two major political parties, and um, they're trying to gather enough voters to win an election. They're not competing with minor parties. So if one party loses a segment of voters, the other party may just swoop in and try to get a majority so that they're able to win elections and govern. And remember, that's what political parties seek to do. They seek to win elections and govern. So we started, we, you know, realignment um, begins under FDR. African-Americans are seeing opportunity in um, FDR's New Deal programs and realignment uh, was largely completed during Richard Nixon's time in office. Richard Nixon had a so-called Southern strategy where he recognized a lot of Southern Democrats um, were much more aligned with his Republican Party, and he was, he was seeking to reach out to them with messages that 
said that you know he wasn't moving interested in moving as fast on civil rights uh wasn't as interested as as being as progressive on the issue of race and equality and certainly there were other factors as well and again now we see essentially the two political parties are almost opposite of what they would have been a hundred years ago the concept of dealignment is used to describe a reduction in party loyalty overall so when you ask people what they are today, the number one response isn't Republican or Democrat when it comes to their political party preference. It's independent. People like to describe themselves as being independent. They're less likely to be active members of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. And in fact, you take a look at two of the major candidates recently um, in for the presidency. Uh, President Trump, uh, t 10 years ago, uh, uh, described himself as a Democrat. He hasn't been particularly loyal uh, to one party or another. Um, and Bernie Sanders is somebody who identified as a Democratic Socialist, as someone who is not particularly associated with the Democratic Party. Both of them had never been to a national party convention until they were major candidates for that particular party's convention. So I think they're both good illustrations of dealignment and how many people are less aligned with being a Republican or a Democrat. Now, what's interesting is if you actually look at voting behavior of independents, we tend to see that they are pretty consistently aligned with either Democrats or Republicans. So people like to call themselves independents, but in many cases, they don't actually vote that way. So why is this two-party system endured? We already talked about the historical foundations of the two-party system right off the bat. Um, the, contest for political office in the United States, particularly at the federal level, broke between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. And within Congress, they start to organize themselves around political parties. They structure the power and the leadership and who gets to set the legislative agenda by party. So there's the historical component. We already talked about that. You've got the role of political socialization. As we've already discussed, You, we develop our uh, political ideological attitudes um, in large part by through the family and through early experiences. So if both parents are Republicans or both parents are Democrats, we're much more likely to be little Democrats or little Republicans. So political socialization means that political culture is slower to change and party identity over time is slower to change. You know, we start at it out in the two party system and this has been passed down from generation to generation. Another big reason why we continue to have a two-party system is our winner-take-all elections. There can only be one winner for a congressional district or for a governor of a state. or And when it comes to the electoral college, each state has a certain number of votes. But in just about every case, you can either get all of those votes or none. So for Minnesota, all 10 of the electoral college votes goes to the candidate that wins at just one more vote than the other candidate. They get all 10 or nothing. This is called a winner-take-all system. So it doesn't make sense for minor parties, minor candidates to run and compete in a winner-take-all system. This is a big difference from what we see in Europe that are much more that has much more proportional systems. So in a proportional system, if you win 15% of the vote, you get 15% of the parliament and your political party could be part of a coalition that runs the government. It makes sense to vote for a minor party in a proportional system, but we don't have a proportional system. It's winner take all. You either win the legislative seat, you either win the presidency in that particular state, or you don't. There's not a lot of demand for um, third parties or minor parties. And we have a number of uh, laws, both at the federal and state level, that favors the two parties when it comes to fundraising, when it comes to uh, public support of political campaigns. These laws create the condition that uh, further strengthen the two parties. And if you think about it, uh, just about everybody in office, right, for the state legislature and Congress, they all got there through the two-party system. So they have a tendency of supporting and passing laws that favor the two-party system. Okay, the role of minor parties in U.S. politics. As I said, the winner-take-all system really makes it seem somewhat irrational to support third parties or minor parties because there's very little chance that that particular candidate is going to win election and, and get to govern. 
But minor parties in the United States have had an impact. Um, some of our minor parties have been ideological in nature, like the Green Party. And those candidates are probably not planning on moving into the White House, but they can influence the debate. And they can bring up issues like climate change and, and draw more attention to those. And then in many cases, those issues that the minor parties care about will be taken up by the major parties. We've also seen parties splinter. We saw this with Teddy Roosevelt when he was unable to win the Republican nomination at their convention, even though he did very well in the primary elections, he was unable to win the Republican nomination. And so he splintered away from the Republicans, Teddy Roosevelt did, and formed the Bull Moose Party. And this fractured Republican support and it allowed Woodrow Wilson um, to win the presidency. So sometimes when a party splinters, when it breaks up, that can also have a big impact. We saw in 2000, um, likely Ralph Nader's run as a Green Party candidate took enough votes from the Democratic Party and Al Gore to allow George W. Bush to win that election, a very close election, and yet another example where um, one candidate won the popular vote, Al Gore, and the other candidate won the Electoral College, which was George W. Bush. And I've already discussed the rise of independence. More people are self-describing themselves as independents, even though their voting behavior usually will put them closer to one political party or another. And I think the rise of both Donald Trump and the rise of Bernie Sanders are good illustrations of this too. All right, to sum up, an interest groups and organization whose members share objectives and attempt to influence government policy. Um, the most numerous and impactful types of interest groups tend to be economic interest groups, which include business, agricultural, labor, and professional groups, but others include environmental, public interest, ideological, and identity groups. Interest groups use both direct and indirect te techniques, so make sure that you understand those. Um, a political party, on the other hand, they're a group of activists, political activists, who organize to win elections and run the government. That's what separates them from an interest group. Uh, political parties are collections of interests. The evolution of our uh, political parties can be divided into seven periods. Make sure that you understand that as you read through the text. And through most of the modern period, the, both the Republican and Democratic parties have been closely matched in strength. The two major parties have dominated the political landscape in the United States for almost two centuries for a number of reasons that we outline. Um, a key reason is the style of elections we have are winner-take-all elections, um, our political socialization of our two-party system, and the precedent that was started early on between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And here are your discussion questions for the week. They'll be posted under the weekly discussion area. Uh, we also have a question here about the NRA film. You can also use the NRA film as the topic of your next analysis paper. For discussion this week, like every week, one substantive original post and at least two responses to the on-topic posts of your classmates. Have a fantastic week and reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns.